Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. There'll maybe some, a few more people drift in this afternoon, but first of all, I wanna thank you for coming and participating in this Cedar Creek collaboration, listening, learning, and exploring. Um, we really appreciate you being here and being a part of this project. My name is Alan Haynes. I work for the DeKalb County Soil and Water Conservation District and I am part of the steering committee for this project. Uh, some housekeeping rules, if you haven't done so already, please register back at the tables. There are agendas for today's meeting back there and a few other handouts. If you'd like a, a bottled water, there's some on the back table back there for you to pick up. If you haven't located them, the restrooms are out the door and to the left. And one of the reasons we're able to move forward with this meeting is because we agreed to follow COVID-19 protocol. So thank you all for showing up with your masks on, being willing to participate six feet apart, and being courteous of one another. We greatly appreciate that as well. When we first started this work, we reached out to Purdue Extension to see who might be able to help facilitate such a project. And when we did that, we discovered this wonderful thing called conservation through community leadership. Had never stumbled upon that before. One of my board supervisors asked me, he's like, how come I've not heard of this before? To which I responded, sometimes you just gotta ask the right question, <laughs> which I don't always do. And so we did, and to here to tell you more about that program and, and how today is gonna work is Dan Walker. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Um, Conservation Through Community Leadership is a program where we get together large groups, well, in this case, sort of a, a kickoff uh, to start looking at uh, conservation issues, environmental issues, throughout, uh, across boundaries, and with a collaborative group. So that's really uh, the focus of Conservation Through Community Leadership. Um, this is the first step for that. There will be a couple follow-on meetings where we work with a smaller group of uh, interested individuals such as yourselves or um, other people that are invited to that group and they will work on developing an action plan and uh, putting together strategies for moving forward in the Cedar Creek watershed. So that's kind of the, and that'll happen over a series of months. Um, so look forward to uh, further meetings and participating in that event. <clears throat> so from the steering committee, um, that's sort of the, the driving force behind the, the CCL program uh, for today. And that's, we have an Allen County representative, Teresa Brown's here. Uh, we have DeKalb County representatives, Alan Hayes, like I said, crossing borders and looking at the watershed as a whole is important for the program. Uh, DeKalb County representative, uh, Denny Taylor, Cedar Creek Drainage Board. Agriculture representative, uh, Jacob Walker from Walker Farms. And environment, David Van Gilder, Friends of Cedar Creek. And finally from recreation, which is important for the watershed, um, is Jeff Baxter from Allen County Parks. So go ahead. Uh, the facilitators today, well, the facilitators for the whole program overall are going to be myself, Dan Walker. I'm a community planning extension specialist. There's Steve Yoder, who is uh, a regional educator uh, with community development extension. And then on the back is Kara Salazar, who is assistant program leader um, for extension and uh, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. And I'm also a part of Illinois Indiana Sea Grant as well. So you'll, you'll hear that name thrown around um, from time to time as we introduce ourselves. Um, it's a bi-state program focused on water quality and the conservation efforts. So uh, go ahead, Steve. The agenda for today, right now we're doing welcome introductions and overviews, um, and then we'll get into presentations with a moderated discussion panel. And this is gonna be um, a pretty interesting experience. We're, we're gonna learn more about the watershed. We're gonna learn about different, different interests in the watershed um, from different perspectives. And that's kind of the idea of today is for everybody to get an idea of what's going on, where are we at now? And as you can see, there's a couple maps here that shows the, all of the, so Cedar Creek is a Huck 10, which is the big apple, and then there's uh, smaller little sections of it, which are Huck 12s, and each one of those sort of nests within the big 
uh, the Big Huck Tim. Um, there's different communities uh, that are across the counties and, and such there that you can look at uh, as your leisure uh, during the day. So back to the agenda here. Um, after the panelists give their presentations, each presentation will be about 10 minutes or so. Uh, we'll move into a moderated discussion, and Steve's going to lead that uh, a moderated discussion panel. We also have uh, somebody joining uh, from Purdue via WebEx or Zoom, so we're integrating that into it's Melissa Wilhelm, and she'll be presenting as the fifth presenter today. So at 3:30, we'll we'll end it. So go ahead, Steve. So shared expectations. These are sort of the ground rules for today. Uh, Alan laid it out nicely. Um, the first one up there is adhere to the COVID-19. Uh, safety protocols we have in place, you know, wear your mask, step outside if you need to, um, participate fully, so let's share your thoughts and ideas, ask questions, especially during the Q&A with the, with the uh, panelists. Hear one another out, so um, follow on with discussions, ask questions of, of the responses, you know, if you want to, but listen to the uh, responses and, and consider them fully. Uh, provide brief responses, make an effort to uh, consider all the ideas, and these are sort of um, guidelines for the whole series. So as we're working in smaller groups in the, in the future uh, on some of these issues, uh, keep these things in mind as well. Uh, we'll arrive and end on time. Ask for clarification if you have any questions about something. Uh, silence and put away all electronic devices. If you do get a call, go ahead and step out. It's no problem. Uh, keep the purpose of the meeting in mind. Uh, we'll have a parking lot over here. So if you have an idea that doesn't make sense right now, or maybe it's a good idea, but it's sort of off the topic, We'll write it down, we'll keep it over there, and uh, we'll bring it back up toward the end, uh, revisit it, if you will. And then finally, work constructively toward a solution, disagreement is okay. Um, lots of perspectives always come to mind here, and so um, sometimes those conflict, but we're all here to, to progress, and that's the important part. And then finally, we always open it up for other people to uh, add anything that they might like to share or think that is appropriate. So I'll give you a second for that and if you want to do something you can just blurt it out but uh, this is sort of a more structured event so it may not be uh, super relevant go ahead Steve and so now we're gonna do introductions and I don't know how the best way to do this might be I'm gonna start from my right and go row by row back um, I'll sort of model up we want you to share, share name and affiliation only um, in the interest of time, I'm Dan Walker, Community Planning Extension Specialist with Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. And so I'll, I'll go over to you. I'm Dale Breyer with the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Division of Outdoor Recreation. Thank you. Ben Wicker with the Indiana Agriculture Nutrient Office. I'm Heather Barth with Acres Land Trust. And I'm Chad Shaw with Fort Wayne Parks and Recreation. And Steve Gilder, um, Purdue Extension Go to the orange end. Go ahead. Uh, Sarah Delbeck, uh, I'm on the Board of Supervisors for Utah Western UCD and then also Farm in Utah Okay. Jenny Taylor, I'm uh, on a three member board of Cedar Creek out of Utah Jacob Walker, Walker Farms with Utah Farms. Anne Klein, Purdue Extension, Noble Farms. Okay. Alan Hunter, Utah County, And let's go around the back to the yellow. Okay, so um, we can go to the next slide, but I'll, I'm going to turn it back over to Alan to uh, lead you through the next part of the day. So, um, where is it? There you are, Alan. Thank you. Like many of you, <clears throat> I've grown up, lived in this area my whole life. And so I've grown up listening, learning, and exploring Cedar Creek. Um, but it wasn't until my work 
with the SWCD that I began to hear the stories and history of Cedar Creek from a variety of different sources, each unique from their own experience with, the, with Cedar Creek. Stories that ranged from memories on the creek with grandpa to the creek's significance in the agricultural community. Um, stories about the creek's unique features, geography and location in the counties. Lots of stories of the challenges, frustration and struggle in decision making about Cedar Creek. Stories of the creek's ability to totally disregard all our best intentions and do what it wanted to do anyways. The ever-changing image of Cedar Creek. Stories of mistakes made and lessons learned regarding the creek. And more and more, in terms of recently, stories of appreciation and enjoyment of Cedar Creek. From all that, I didn't realize I was doing this, but I began to observe there were certain themes that I was seeing from all this information I was taking in. And the first one of those is that while there oftentimes the stories were in conflict with one another, each one of them had an important piece to a bigger puzzle. And as I began to work those together, I'm like, okay, this really is all connected. The other one, and I think this is a pretty significant one, is regardless of the story, there was always an understanding of the incredible importance of this natural resource. And as I began to continue my work with the district, I began hearing stories about climate change and all those stuff, the incredible challenges that Cedar Creek faces in an ever-growing community and a changing environment. I, I've also noticed that over the past several years, there has been increasingly more common ground in these stories. And in the back of my mind, I started thinking like, you know, we could be getting to the point where it's time to have a conversation. Didn't do anything about that other than I asked a few other people if they were noticing similar things. And they were agreeing with me. And lo and behold, Commissioner Brown showed up in DeKalb County with couple of other folks to talk with our drainage board about Cedar Creek. And from that, the decision was made, it was time for a conversation. The purpose of today's meeting is to provide information and perspective to start that conversation. So that's the purpose for, for why we're here today. Blinded by the light. Thank you, Alan. Um, on that, what I wouldn't call a fateful day, but probably more of an alignment of the stars, the conversation started because there has been a lot of misinformation from an Allen County side, having come in as a commissioner in 2011, and a lot of fragmented storylines coming from a variety of different areas. But also recognizing that there's a lot of opportunities that this, quite frankly, body of water op obviously offers to the constituents that not only reside along it, but those that benefit from it, whether it's agriculture or even from a recreational use. We would be remiss if we didn't say flooding is an issue as well, and that drainage on top of all is a very big subject matter, and the fact that there is misinformation about who controls, who doesn't control, and some of those past mistakes and how some of those were handled. Uh, would be, it would be remiss not to mention that there were misfires back in the day. 
So to Alan's point, and again to the whole point and purpose of this meeting and subsequent meetings, is to try to arrive at an opportunity where we can leverage each other's institutional knowledge, their memory of what they, what they saw, what they saw was as a benefit of, of the creek, and all of the attributes that it holds for all of us, whether it's past, present, or future, but also how we can leverage opportunities from a collective group of individuals to try to make it better than what it is and to make it that pristine environment that I think all of us would hope that it would be, serving a multitude of purposes, but also being maintained in a way that is respectful to the land and respectful to future generations. So I thank you all for being here. This is going to be a very educational opportunity because, at least for me, there's a lot of missing pieces and to try to bring all those all together so that then we can start anew and start to create opportunities to make this a better opportunity for the future is going to be extremely exciting. So thank you for being here. Thank you for spending the time. And thank you for what you're going to do in the future. I yield to... much and it's amazing we are right on time so we're going to go into our panel presentations now and how this is going to look is we are going to have our presenters come up and they'll be in order that you see here but I'll make sure to cue them and you'll know who's speaking next but you do have it in your agenda as well so everyone has a set time um, to speak I'll be in the back and I'll flag you when you have about two minutes to wrap up um, if you see me walking up and getting close, then you know you're done. Uh, so we'll just keep it moving forward in that way. Um, Dan has the presentations queued up, so it should move pretty smoothly. Uh, we've chosen the panel format um, so that they are going to all present first, and then we'll have the last part of our session together today as question answer time, because there's so much rich content that we're going to go through today. We thought this would be the best format to get through the information, and then we'll have some nice discussion. So, um, you all have, should have your agenda and pens, so as you're watching the presentations and listening, if you have questions, make sure to write them down so you can make sure to um, ask them once we have that time come up. And then Steve Yoder will be moderating that, so we'll make sure to get, um, get through all of the questions as well. So thank you again for being here today, and with that, I'm going to um, hand it over to Dale Breyer. Um, he's the Division Director for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Division of Outdoor Recreation. And he's going to um, speak to us about the Cedar Creek State um, Scenic River designation. So thanks so much, and it's all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. So how many people here in this room are familiar with the Cedar Creek Scenic River designation? Uh, maybe about half. How many of you know the boundaries of that designation? Oh, okay. You guys are going to make my job a little bit easier then. Um, for those that don't know, Cedar Creek is designated in the uh, State Natural, Scenic, and Recreational River Program. That's established in Indiana Code. Cedar Creek was established in 1976 or 1977. It's one of three. Uh, it starts uh, from the intersection of the St. Joe River and goes upstream about 14 miles to County Road 68 in DeKalb County. So it actually is in two counties. That, that process of scenic designation is not something that the state comes to the counties and proposes. That process starts from the county and comes up. So back in those days, somebody in uh, Cedar, uh, sorry, somebody in Allen County and DeKalb County decided this would be a good idea, approached the DNR. The DNR did a study. Then the results of that study are sent out for public comment locally. And then it goes to the Natural Resources Commission where it's voted on. So. Uh, from the oral history that's been passed down inside the DNR, that process was not as smooth as in some other places. While there was a lot of local support, there was some opposition back in the day. There was um, the, the Isaac Walton League and some uh, legends of conservation here in Allen County, the Dustins, were very worried about the conservation and preservation of Cedar Creek. They were... They wanted to see the creek remain in a natural state, and they worried that the designation would bring more recreation, more destruction, more adverse effects to the river. Uh, so far, we have not seen that. That's not really been a problem. Um, but it was, uh, it was definitely an issue when it was designated. So knowing that the, the DNR manages those rivers, especially in the past, based on the will and the desires of the locals. So 
Cedar Creek got very little attention or money or work done on it because the locals wanted more of a preservation style designation. So the DNR didn't come up and clear out log jams. They didn't come up and do a lot of work on the river. It was left in a very natural state. So Blue River down in Southern Indiana is another one. It's kind of a balance between recreation and conservation. And Wildcat Creek has a much more recreation focus. So it has more access sites. The log jams were cleared out. We actually spent money and effort and had a DNR crew clearing out log jams, picking up trash, picking up tires to make sure that that river was open for recreation. Um, the DNR has pulled back its, I don't know if I should say support, but its involvement with the scenic river programs. The, the law that establishes the scenic rivers does not have a lot of mandates in it. So the law is not filled with thou shalt and thou shalt not. It's a, it's a little more De a designation for recognition and it's what I say a lot about, about a lot of things. It can be as much or as little as what the DNR or the locals want it to be. So in the case of Cedar Creek, it was not a lot. It was the mo of the three, definitely the most hands-off designation. We have since done that to the other two with staffing times and cutbacks and restrictions in the DNR. We're doing that now with all of them. So you may still see some of our old signs we, we haven't done a lot with those. The, the major function that my office still has with the Scenic Rivers is we comment on water permits. So if any work is being done on the, on the river that has to go through the DNR Division of Water, my office is allowed to comment on those. And our job and our goal is to make sure that we preserve those Scenic Rivers with some aesthetic and recreational natural um, concerns. Probably 50% of the comments that we do on all the scenic rivers are bank stabilization projects. So if someone will want to put up a retaining wall or just line the river with riprap, my division will comment back and say, no, you should do that with river rock, natural plantings, more of a natural aesthetic to maintain some of the, uh, the look and the feel of a natural river rather than industrializing it. And that's, that's the super short version. I think I'm going to go on the shorter side here, but I will definitely be around here for questions and answers. All right? Thank you. Thanks, Ben. One yeah. second. Sure. So, good afternoon. My name is Ben Wicker. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Agriculture Nutrient Alliance. Uh, was invited up today by, by Alan to uh, provide kind of a high-level overview of uh, the agricultural perspective, um, you know, as it relates to watersheds and, uh, and use of water in particular. Uh, so uh, the, the title that I, that I laid up here is Healthy Soil, Clean Water, Viable Farms. And that's the mission of the Indiana Ag Nutrient Alliance, but I think it applies even down to the local level when we're thinking about the balance and the perspective from an agricultural perspective of how we're trying to manage our farms, manage the environment around us and, and, and work within that. A um, little bit about IANA is we are a relatively new organization formed up in, in 2018, uh, but a broad collaboration of all the major agricultural uh, conservation agency uh, and, uh, and other conservation partners around the state. And we're really focused on aligning uh, and uh, partnering together to, to make sure that Indiana farmers are keeping at the forefront of those practices and those efforts uh, to, uh, to um, you know, manage their soil, manage uh, the nutrients on their farm in a way that protects water quality, but then also you know, ensures the long-term success of that farm as well. Uh, me, myself, uh, I started as the, the director at the Alliance when it was formed in 2018. Uh, but my background is as a farmer and then also as an agronomist, uh, starting my career out as a certified crop advisor, working with farmers on their farms around how they use fertilizers and manures, how they manage their crop production uh, to be as efficient and productive as, as possible. So when we, when we start to when we have a conversation um, you know, about the importance of agriculture in a, in a watershed and or in our counties, you know, I think it's important to remember the, the, the overall benefit that they provide to those communities. And, and I have to apologize when I pulled my data together. I included Alan DeKalb, and so a, a, 
an apology to Noble County <laughs> for not having them in my aggregated numbers here, but the, the story I think is, is, is consistent, even if we look at these as a county as a whole, but you know, the farms in our communities are major economic drivers and they are key parts of our commu local communities. And so just in DeKalb and Allen counties and, and, and increase these numbers as we include Noble, but we have over 2,500 farms. You know, in annual sales, those total up to nearly a quarter billion dollars, $250 million in annual sales uh, of commodities coming off those farms. In terms of a GDP impact in those two counties, it's nearly half a billion dollars of economic impact and nearly 6,500 jobs when we look at it from the farm gate all the way to processing being impacted in these local communities from agriculture. So it's a key integral industry that we have, uh, have in, uh, in these communities. When it comes to water, in agriculture, we're oftentimes in a Goldilocks situation. It's wanting to be able to manage, you know, we, we have concerns about too much water, we have concerns about too little water. And we spend a lot of our time and a lot of our conversation talking about the amount of water that we have on our farms, how we deal with that and how we work with that. Jake, Sarah, you know, the other farmers in the room, about every conversation you ever have in the agriculture community is, well, What's the water like on your farm? Have you gotten rain lately? Is it too wet? Is it too dry? As we think about how we work on our, work on our farms, managing that too much, that too little is a key integral part to that. But then also when it comes to moving water across our farms, especially in the watershed conversation, that conversation turns to water quality and the things that can move in and with the water. And that could be soil and nutrients and so the conversation turns then to what's the fate of those nutrients? Where are they going and how are they managed? And when it comes to nutrients, and this is just a simplified example of two that get a lot of attention in a lot of places, nitrogen and phosphorus, there's lots of different pathways they can take. And I will disclaim, this is not, uh, I like this model because it's big and it's simple, but if I was to scale them as far as relative movement of or relative amounts of where those go, it's not scaled that way at all. We're very proud in the agriculture community that we have really high use efficiency of our nutrients. The majority is held in the soil, but we do have loss pathways through runoff and erosion, as well as leaching through the soil. And so as we think about that, we think about management of nutrients in our watershed from the agricultural landscape, we have to consider how we mitigate that risk and how we move forward with that. But it's not just a situation where we can say, well, just shut it off. Don't use any more nutrients, don't, you know, don't make any more applications, don't manage in that way. Because when we think about the sustainability and the viability of our farms, nutrients are essential. And so I have two sets of corn here, one that has been adequately fertilized and one that is deficient in nitrogen. And you don't have to be a farmer to probably understand which sample you'd rather have, right? You want the full, complete ear. This relates not only to the conversation at the farm gate uh, in terms of um, you know, success for that individual farmer, but it also relates to the larger sustainability conversation. It takes many more acres of ground of production to produce the same amount of crop from an underutilized acre than it does from an acre that operates at a full efficiency. And so maintaining access to all the tools, being as efficient and as best as stewards with those tools uh, that we have is, is critically important. This is important too from a farmer and they consider these uh, decisions, you know, very seriously, not just because, you know, they want to be good stewards of the environment and good stewards, uh, good stewards of the landscape, but there's a cost associated with the use of those nutrients as well. For uh, your average farm, and this is a, an average Purdue crop budget, uh, fertilizers and manures tends to uh, represent the largest or the first or the second largest uh, variable cost that a farmer will have per acre on his, on his land. They're not cheap, and so any way that they can gain more efficiency, any way that they can produce more bushels with, you know, per pound of nutrients utilized is going to be uh, to, the, uh, to the advantage of that farmer and to the advantage uh, of the environment as a whole. So what are farmers doing to manage this? There's a couple key strategies that farmers are utilizing. Uh, and I'm going to present it at the strategy level, but then within each of these, there's actual practices, and, uh, and through th further discussion, we could talk about what some of those might be. But first is the four R's of nutrient management, and so this is when farmers are utilizing those essential fertilizers and manures on their crop. Are they giving consideration to what they call the four R's? 
Are they thinking about the right source of that nutrient? Are they applying it at the right rate to be as efficient for that crop and soil needs that mitigates that risk of loss? Are they applying it at the right time? Uh, that is when the uh, nutrients are most likely to be taken up by the crop and in the right place. And through advancements in technology, through advancements of analysis that farmers are able to do down to the sub acre level, they have continued to adopt more and more practices that allow them to become more and more efficient fitting within this framework of, uh, of the four R's. The idea and the concept of soil health, something that has become increasingly popular and increasingly talked about here in recent years, fits in with this as well. This is the idea of improving uh, and maintaining the function of that, uh, of that soil over time. And we've seen vast improvements or vast increases in the amount of practices that help encourage our soil health, whether that's reduced and no tillage, that reduces erosion, helps protect that topsoil from being washed away in a rain and, uh, and move through. It's through the adoption of cover crops that help hold that soil through the winter. It's looking at diversified rotations, growing more than just corn and soybeans, adding other crops into that mix as well um, that have helped to increase that as well. Increasingly, farmers are adopting more of these practices in order to better maintain their soil, to improve the health of that soil, and that has positive impacts on the watershed and water quality as well. And then, and I apologize, my, my pictures are a little wide, wide here, but there's a whole suite of different things that farmers do at the edge of their fields and within their fields as well to protect that, whether that's grass waterways to help manage, uh, manage if, uh, flow of the water when we have those rains. It's buffering along uh, streams and field edges. It's uh, improving the, uh, the tile drainage and adding in uh, uh, filtering or blind inlets or other practices um, you know, that help reduce the amount of nutrients that can move through to filter that, that uh, fertilizer and soil that ultimately has positive impacts down the, down the stream. So that's a very quick, high-level perspective on uh, agriculture, how water is important to us, uh, how the use of fertilizers, manures, and access to those nutrients is important to us, but also how the management of those uh, resources is critically important to us as well. So uh, thanks again for the invitation to, to share with you today and, and look forward to any uh, specifics you might have through the, the panel. So thank you. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Heather Barth. I'm with Acres Land Trust and I'm going to focus on the environmental aspects of uh, Cedar Creek and the Cedar Creek Corridor. Although I, um, I must mention that we have our hand in all of the themes in today. Um, Acres owns farm ground within Cedar Creek Corridor uh, that's in production. Um, I recreate uh, the trails that we provide within the corridor. The scenic designation, um, the Dustins were two of our founding members and although they had some reservations about the the, the designation, um, we're quite proud and pleased that um, our founding members did have a hand in, in getting that designation, but um, I'm here today to talk about the environment. Uh, so first slide, please. Uh, so that dark green stripe along the top um, is uh, Cedar Creek. So this is visible um, on Google Earth. So from space, uh, Cedar Creek is, is visible with that dark green uh, swipe across the top. Um, this particular area was recognized in the early 1900s um, as a special unique place in that it was once considered for a state park location. Um, that park was instead um, Pokagon State Park up in Steuben County, but this was a, a very close number two um, for a, a possible state park. Um, so it's, that's 120 years ago that people living and working um, in this area recognize that this is, this is worth some attention. Um, so for this reason, um, we have the dedication. Um, for this reason, um, Acres began actually protecting land within the corridor um, in the 1980s. Uh, and this gives you an idea of the land that is protected. Um, our definition of the corridor is Auburn to Leo, although the watershed um, obviously stretches far beyond those boundaries. So this is land protected by acres and conservation partners, Isaac Wall League, um, Girl Scouts, um, there's other conservation easements along here. Um, but what's really notable is the gaps. Um, the bulk 
of the opportunity to uh, preserve and protect uh, the environment and habitats lies uh, within individual um, landowners. Um, our goal is not to own all of the land along Cedar Creek, um, but our goal is to facilitate um, other people and other groups um, working to incorporate best practices uh, to protect this special, unique place. Um, and that's more than a thousand acres of land um, that's currently protected along Cedar Creek. So this is, uh, this shows you the Tunnel Valley and the Huntertown Aquifer, um, which is a primary groundwater source for Northern Allen County. So when we talk about how important water is um, to farmers, uh, to recreation, uh, to, you know, just local homeowners, um, this particular area is, is um, a significant source. Um, and in fact, as it drains into the St. Joseph River, provides drinking water for the city of Fort Wayne. Um, so the way this was formed is really unique. Uh, there was a glacier that ran uh, uh, at a diagonal this way, and right along the edge of the glacier, um, it froze to the ground. So it trapped groundwater um, right under there, um, which ended up digging deep into the sediment, releasing all of the sediment, and it burst up to the northwest um, along where our property by Centennial Woods is. Um, and so it's, uh, it, this is why we have the Tunnel Valley. This is why that, particularly in Northern Allen County, it looks the way it does along um, Cedar Canyon Road, the hills and, and windingness of it. Um, but it's all due to the way uh, the glacier um, stopped and dug out that tunnel. And um, initially the creek flowed northwest, which is the opposite directed direction of what it flows now. Um, but what this means is that the sediment that it dumped uh, created, uh, it left really rich soil, um, particularly right along where the creek is now, which takes me to my next slide. So we're gonna talk about some of the vegetation um, along Cedar Creek um, and within the corridor. Um, so I'm not gonna read through the list, but you see there's some uh, really uh, unique um, vegetation, flowers, plants, grasses that grow along Cedar Creek. The only known population of Indian paintbrush um, and yellow cocoon documented in Allen County um, is along Cedar Creek. Um, so because of the, the soil type that's right there along the creek, we see some of these unique um, plants really thriving. Um, obviously we've got the oak hickory forest, the, the beech maple, um, the sycamore trees along Cedar Creek. If you've ever paddled the creek, um, the sycamore trees are quite stunning. Lots of pawpaw patches. Um, and then of course the spring wildflowers that we see on Acres Preserves are, are pretty spectacular. Next slide, please. Um, and then we talk about the wildlife. Um, we have documented bobcat um, along Cedar Creek. Most recently, um, early this spring, out at the Acres office, a staff member um, got into her car to leave after dark and turned on her headlights and just out in front of her car um, was a bobcat. Um, so that's been documented. Um, the turkey, the deer um, that we often see, but we're also looking at mink, uh, freshwater fish and mussel. Just recently, the American Brook lamprey was found in Cedar Creek um, on one of our closed properties right along C uh, Coldwater Road. Um, lots of interesting birds, um, the blue racer snake. Um, so because this is a large contiguously protected area, we see these species um, really starting to come back and thrive. Um, I myself have seen mink, uh, river otter uh, in the creek, um, so it's a, it's a pretty special place. Um, so because Cedar Creek is so important to Acres and that we've recognized um, the value that it provides um, to the environment, to recreational opportunities, um, um, to even economic development, um, it's an attractive place, um, which is why we see the, the housing development that we see in Northern Allen County, because Cedar Creek is an attractive place for people who want to um, live and work in the area. Um, we have created um, a microsite dedicated to Cedar Creek. So you can go there and check out all the information that, that we um, publicize on Cedar Creek. Um, I did bring a few copies of a book that we had written about Cedar Creek. Um, I'll leave them back on the table, but you can also get the book through this site. 
Um, but what our goal here is to help utilize Cedar Creek to create a deeper sense of place. Um, oftentimes when we're asked, well, where do you live? Oh, I'm a, a quarter mile west of the intersection of Coldwater and Chapman Road. Um, our goal is to get people to say, you know, when asked, where do you live? I live within the Cedar Creek corridor. This is happening in other areas of the country. We want to see it happening here in, um, in Northeast Indiana um, because we truly feel that Cedar Creek is um, of great value to the community, um, far beyond even some of the, you know, some of the themes that are, are being brought up today. Um, um, so that is my um, presentation. And again, the books will be back on the table. Um, you can also get them through the microsite. Um, and I thank you for your time. Thanks again for asking me to be here today. Um, I especially want to do uh, applaud the group who put this together and especially the conservation through community leadership um, and bringing people together to not just talk about one avenue with all this, but really across the board um, of sustainability, all three bottom lines, economic, environmental, and social. Um, I think everybody came to the table today to bring all that together. So uh, I think that's really awesome. I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, my name is Chad Shaw. I'm the Superintendent of Landscape and Horticulture with Fort Wayne Parks and Rec. Um, I'm, I'm not a recreation uh, specialist or expert by any means. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm a designer. So most of the stuff I do uh, comes down to design. That's for recreation areas. That's for the safety of our patrons. That's for uh, a variety of things. Um, a large part of what I do with Fort Wayne Parks and Rec is also with our riparian management division also. So um, I have particular interest in not only our downtown rivers, but of the creek and all the surrounding waterways as well. Um, another part of kind of what ties into that is my uh, board membership with Northeast Indiana Water Trails. Um, we're a, a, a water trail group here in the region uh, that promotes the act of recreation, safety, and stewardship of our waterways. So kind of bringing both of those perspectives here. Um, personally, a uh, kayaker, canoeer, hiker um, on Cedar Creek pretty often. Uh, it's probably one of my number one hits around here. Uh, Tonkle to State Road 1 is usually my, 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 my segment that I'm on the most, I suppose. Um, also, hike uh, Acres Properties, Matea. So I'm, I'm a south sider in Fort Wayne, but uh, as far as recreation goes, I come up here pretty often. Um, so preparing for today, I just kind of took a look at what we have, like what's the inventory? Um, as Dale mentioned, it's about 14 miles of the, the designation anyway for the recreational river designation up here um, from State Road, or County Road 68 to the St. Joe. And it, this was the first time I really dug into that designation. And according to that, there are two official launch sites, uh, Cook's Landing and uh, Leo Cedarville there at Highway 1. Um, I think through the years though, over the last several decades, two more sites have kind of found their way into the mix. Uh, one being an uh, uh, unofficial launch at Tonkle Road, uh, another one uh, here in Matea on, on uh, Hirsch, uh, there at the parking lot there. Um, and then as you kind of spill out into the St. Joe, you can go on down to uh, the new launch at Mayhew and then on down to Shove Park also there in Fort Wayne. Um, so what are people doing to recreate on Cedar Creek? Uh, paddling. Um, well, let me back up a little bit. I'd, I'd like to share a few numbers actually, because especially when it comes to paddling and people being on the water, I don't know how many of you have noticed, but over the last year, if several years, if not just the last year, the numbers have skyrocketed, at least here anyway. Uh, I reached out to Fort Wayne Outfitters and I asked them for some of their numbers and they were able to give me their rental numbers from the past several years in July. So dipping all the way back to 2014, they had 450 rentals in July of 2014. Uh, last year was kind of shaky. Promenade Park, where they oper operate out of, was just opening. Uh, they were only at 695, but granted, that's with the park being closed up until August of that year. This year in July, 2,300 boat rentals in the month of July. So think back from 2014, where they only had 450. It's more than it's it's quadrupled uh, there in just a few years. Uh, similarly, the trading post up on the Mongo. Uh, between this last year and this year, they've seen a 45% increase in boat rentals. Um, that's not to mention the fact that earlier this year, for several weeks, you couldn't go into any box store or sporting store and find a kayak or canoe to purchase. They were sold out. 
So I think COVID had a lot to do with that. People were trying to get out, do things that they could do on their own. But I'm willing to bet that a lot of those people aren't just going to store away their boats and never touch them again after this year once they finally got out and seen what, what, what's out there. Uh, also, downtown Fort Wayne, just river-centric programs uh, through the Parks Department. Uh, last year, same thing. The park wasn't even open on the river yet. Uh, more than 400 people participated through programs alone, uh, not to mention all the rentals that brought people right down to the river, the river boat tours, et cetera, et cetera. So thousands of people, many of which had never been on the rivers in Fort Wayne anyway, downtown, had got out, experienced something new, and, and have that in their lives now. So anyway, on Cedar Creek, what are people doing? Yeah, they're paddling a lot. Um, personally, I've noticed whenever I come into the uh, unofficial site there at Tonkel, um, anybody that drives there on any weekend through the summer sees cars lined up down the road. Probably to the detriment of some, but to the enjoyment of all the people there, right? Uh, hiking. Um, Heather mentioned the flora and the fauna, the diverse, diverse ecology that's in the corridor, not to mention the awesome geology. Uh, really brings people out for the hiking. Um, there's plenty to see. It's not flat. You head south of town, everything's dead flat. This area just doesn't feel like you're in Allen County much anymore. Uh, and there is some fishing. I'm not a huge fisherman, but uh, just even doing a Google search on fishing in Cedar Creek, you can definitely pull up some hits and people do enjoy fishing up here as well. So some of the opportunities I see, you know, I approach anything like this from a design standpoint. I'm looking at what we have and start to analyze that and look at the opportunities and the constraints with it. So some of the opportunities I see recreation-wise, it's relatively affordable, if not free, uh, to, to come and do a lot of these things up here on the creek. Um, scenic, it's natural, it's semi-secluded, you can get away, it's quiet. Uh, it's a short drive from Fort Wayne, big urban center. Also a very short drive off of 69 if you're coming from the north or from anywhere around the region. Uh, Paddling-wise, um, a lot of times what turns me off to going to new rivers and stuff anyway is being unsure about the shuttling situation. Uh, just one instance here, Tonkel to Mayhew, if you were to go down Cedar Creek to the St. Joe and then get out at Mayhew, that's like a two mile drive or something between those two sites to shuttle between. So it's really easy to go get a full day in paddling and not have to drive, you know, 45 minutes or so to go get yourself picked up, you know. Um, it's public. Uh, a lot of public lands, it's open, and in many cases, it's protected. Um, there are several conservation easements. I think they're pretty small, right, Heather, along the way? But there are protected lands through acres, um, and there are six acres properties with hiking trails along the creek, yeah. is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's plenty out there that's free, open, public for people to just enjoy at their own will. Some of the constraints I see, though, in regards to recreations, uh, I hate to say it because I, I don't love seeing it get uh, added everywhere, but honestly, it's parking. Uh, parking and access um, to some of the launch sites. Um, the actual launch sites, say at Cook's Landing, although the water levels are really low and it's hard to paddle out of there sometimes, there is a parking lot there. State Road 1 there is a lot, but again, uh, many weekends that I've been there, that lot has been absolutely full and you, you know you got to wiggle your way into a spot on the grass beside there. Uh, the access part is another one. Uh, as far as the boat launches themselves go, there aren't, there aren't really awesome launch sites there. It's kind of precarious. Uh, it's a little dangerous. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I witnessed one lady break her leg just this year carrying a boat down to one of the sites. Um, so uh, especially if there's a lot of novice or first time folks out there, there's some, you know, the access sites are, are limiting. Uh, another constraint, there aren't any restrooms or rest areas really along the corridor at all, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but when you increase a lot of use and have more and more people, um, it, it potentially could be. Uh, really kind of the, the biggest constraint that we see though is when it comes down to uh, both safety and information. Um, there's not really a great source of information out there, especially in physical form right along the corridor anywhere that tells people about where they're going, uh, what's along the way, what amenities there are, what water levels may be. And while those sources of information are out there, they're not readily available to people right when they get to the site or when they're on the water or on trails. Um, 
you know, if you've got a smartphone with you, you can look it up, but as far as any signage, anything like that, there's really not anything out there to help people aware of that. And a lot of that comes to the springtime. Uh, Kyle and I were just talking this morning, you know, the, the water levels in the spring are high. It's a really flashy stream. You get a big storm and water comes up. If somebody's planned on coming out, they're a novice paddler, they could get out on the water, get stuck up against the log jammer and one of those strainers, and it becomes a safety issue. So if people could start to be able to have some foresight or a way to, to look for that foresight before they were to go out, that might uh, help with some of those safety issues as well. Um, so really, I guess I'd like to close with, you know, some of the potential impacts of increased or even promoted use recreationally in the stream. Well, that's not a bad thing at all. I mean, more people don't automatically need to mean that it's bad. Um, it really comes down to an education issue, and that's education on both safety and stewardship. Um, so it touches on the environmental and the ecological issues. It touches on the human safety issues and just like a little bit of general know-how or general education on everything that uh, is really associated with recreation. Thanks.
Now, obviously, I only have a few minutes to give you an overview. We don't even have time to dive into one of these reports, let alone all of these reports. So what I want to do is just give you a few high-level takeaways, and then certainly um, I can answer questions during the Q&A. Uh, my contact information will be provided at the end. Anybody in the room, you are welcome to email me, give me a phone call. I'm here as a resource to you. Um, so just a few high-level um, outcomes from these reports that I think are of particular interest to the conversations you'll be having um, throughout this collaboration. The first one is that, you know, really climate change is not a problem, just a problem for faraway places and distant points in the future. When we look at our observations, um, going back the last hundred years, we can see from the measurements on the ground that we are getting warmer and we are getting wetter. Okay, and this holds in all parts of the state. So what I'm showing you here are state level averages. We have these for different regions of the state as well. But the takeaway message is that we have gotten warmer by about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. We have gotten wetter. We see about six and a half inches more rainfall today than we did 125 years ago. And remember, we're talking about the climate, not the weather. Okay, so when we start talking about something like a full degree of warming, that actually is pretty significant. That's not the same as our weather, okay? That's our climate, that's our long-term average, our long-term look at these conditions. Another takeaway from the report, not just are we um, seeing that increase happening, but we're gonna see it continuing and intensifying. So we are seeing that Indiana is expected to warm about five to six degrees by the middle of this century. Okay, again, that's our climate, not our weather. That's a big deal. When we shift that average, that corresponds to uh, fewer mild days, more hot days, a shift in our seasons, both the timing of them and the length of them. Right, we're gonna have a more mild cold season. So I looked at some of the numbers specific to Allen County, and they're very similar for DeKalb and Noble County as well. When I say a longer warm season, we're talking about um, a frost-free growing season that's about a month longer in the middle of the century compared to what it's been in the past. So starting a little bit earlier in the spring, ending a little bit later in the fall. These are averages. Some years will be much longer, some years not as long. When we average it out, we're looking at about a month longer of that growing season. It has implications for our water demands. It has implications for the types of species that thrive, whether they're desired or undesired. That has implications for human health when we're talking about increase in warm days. We're looking at about three to four times as many 90 degree days in Northeast Indiana than we had in the past. Think about what that means in our day to day lives. Um, water management is going to be a problem. So our climate's changing, it's going to keep getting warmer, and water management is going to be a challenge. All right, when we look at the middle of the century, we're talking about six to eight percent increase in that average annual rainfall. But when we look at it by season, and this was alluded to a little bit by Ben, um, when he was talking about trying to deal with too much and too little water. So when we look at how these projected changes in rainfall um, distribute over the seasons, we're looking at quite a significant increase in the winter and spring. And that's a time when we're already prone to flooding. Maybe we just don't need that water. And we're looking at a modest decline at a time of year when we want the water, when we need it for drinking supplies and for wildlife and for our environment. Uh, so, Water's gonna be a challenge. And let's not forget, this is an interconnected system. So if you have changes in temperature and rainfall, that goes on to alter all different aspects of your hydrologic cycle. So we're talking about runoff patterns, right? Those are pretty closely gonna follow that change, that amplified cycle in rainfall. We're talking about changes in snow cover. When you're talking about more rainfall and warmer, we're gonna have, um, Less falling as rain, more falling, or less falling as snow, more falling as rain. And 
in the end, we need to remember too, we see cascading far-reaching impacts. And that's really the, the takeaway message from a lot of our assessment. You have warmer, wetter conditions, altered uh, hydrologic state, it's going to have impacts on your aquatic ecosystems, your quality of recreation, um, the success of agricultural production, all of the things that matter in the watershed. So I put up here on the screen just one example of graphic from one of our reports, um, really trying to emphasize this rippling effect, right? We can trace the path from having a change in temperature and rainfall to changing the water temperature to how that affects the oxygen levels and what that means for a fish species, as an example. So there's all these different pathways that we have to consider, and when we do that across the board, we see that these changes in these basic climate variables lead to cascading, far-reaching impacts. So just to recap, I know I went through a lot of information in the course of 10 minutes, um, but our observations show us we are getting warmer, we are getting wetter, and we are going to be challenged as we move forward as we have to deal with more extreme heat, increasing heavy rainfall. Uh, seasonal changes are absolutely going to be critical to our ability to manage these systems, not just looking at annual changes. And we need to be thinking creatively about how these far-reaching impacts affect the day-to-day -day operations and the the long-term goals of what we're doing in the watershed. Now, I say this one for last because I think it's the most important, and that is where we end up depends on the choices we make. Okay, these aren't set in stone. Sorry, that was my timer to let me know I'm long-winded. Uh, these are not set in stone. Um, we have the ability to adapt. If we see rain in the forecast, we take an umbrella. Okay, so if we're seeing these types of changes in our climate already happening and continuing for the coming decades, there are adjustments that we can make once we are aware of, of those risks and those threats. And so that can help reduce the overall significance of those impacts if we start incorporating those into our long-term planning. So again, thank you so much for having me. Um, my contact information is here on the screen. My email is the best way to get in touch with me. Um, also visit us uh, on our website. Check out those reports and let me know what questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you all the panelists for providing that great set of information. Now is the chance for all of our panelists to answer questions related to their expertise. And we'll do this through a moderated discussion that I will um, moderate. Um, and we're gonna ask that um, the questions which will come from all of us here in the audience um, be short and related to the topic. So to help us out a bit, um, if any of the questions do start to go off topic or maybe get really detailed, then Kara will help us out here. She's got one of those facilitative parking lots that we can put great ideas up there, but maybe they're not quite on topic. Maybe they're too detailed. We'll capture those for um, consideration later by this group. Also, she'll be kind of capturing some of the major themes on another flip chart so that we can kind of see where this conversation is going kind of at the big picture level. Um, also, I ask that the, uh, that the uh, panelists spend about two or so minutes answering the questions. That way we can get through a lot of questions in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. And ask that the uh, questions from the audience be fairly succinct. And because this is COVID time, I'm going to handle this by, I'll, I'll have the control of the mic here because we need to have you speak into the mic because this is being recorded. And we'll let you know about that later on, how you, how you can find out about the recording. I'll go ahead and walk with, around with this. If you could speak into the microphone, and I'll go to our panelists to answer those questions. Um, so that's how we'll do it. All right. So does anyone have any questions to start out for our panelists? I'll start with you here. Leo Breyer. Uh, if I own land along the scenic portion of Cedar Creek, and because of all these uh, dead ash logs and what have you falling in the creek all the time now that they've all died mostly, 
and I have a big log jam against my, my shore of Cedar Creek in the scenic portion. Can I go in there by myself and clean those logs out without anybody's supervision? So uh, the rules on log jam removal and, and logs and removing things from a creek or a stream aren't different on a scenic river than they would be on any other river in the state. So any kind of work that you would do on a log jam or removing logs that are up against your property would start with the Indiana DNR Division of Water. Uh, they do have some log jam exemption rules for small projects, things that really won't affect the flow. And a lot of the private landowner uh, logs and log jams that you describe would fall under that. So there is, again, to state, there's nothing in the Scenic River law that addresses log jams or log jam removal. Thank you. I now have a two-parter going back to the log jam thing, and I don't know if you can answer that, Dale. Um, Therese mentioned earlier maintaining the Cedar Creek, and I think um, uh, for some of us in this room, a red flag might have gone up because we don't necessarily want it um, maintained in the sense that um, a surveyor's office or something like that's gonna go in and take care of it, but there is definitely a log jam issue um, where it's cutting away into property owners' um, livelihood and um, even you know their their property if they just have a, a home there. So um, working at NERC and working for Northeast Indiana Water Trails, I've been contacted by homeowners about the log jams. So um, this is kind of a general question that what can we do about addressing the log jam without going in with heavy machinery um, or something that's going to affect the aesthetic value of the creek or natural value of the creek and um, how do we go about getting a collective group together to push that forward? That's the first one. <laughs> Why don't we do that one first? Okay. okay. So um, would you like to start with that? I, I can try. So. Um, one of the misconceptions with log jams, especially um, individual landowners or in rural settings, is log jams are bad. And that is not the case. I know if you're trying to paddle through an area that a log jam is bad, but if you're looking at fish spawning sites and fishing sites, that log jams can be good. So um, th there is not necessarily an automatic, we must conquer the river and remove all log jams. I, I would hate to see that as a mentality here, but there are definitely times when a log jam is either damaging property, doing damage or eroding banks, doing something to crops, endangering a building, endangering paddlers. So it is a, there is both sides to log jams. And as far as log jam removal, it has been a, it's an ongoing topic and an ongoing question that I would mostly defer back to the DNR Division of Water if you're trying to do an actual log jam. Um, there, are, there have been some informal rules. The, the DNR is not out sending out the log jam police looking for fresh cut marks to see who's done what anywhere. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Uh, Probably well, not. <laughs> we've already worked with, uh, a group of us have already um, mm -hmm. worked with the DNR on it. Um, you're probably not familiar with the size of the log jams on the Cedar Creek. I've, I've some seen some the, big ones. They were some of the, and I'm not, you know, yes, I'm in full agreement that we need to have log jams for mm -hmm. um, aquatic life and whatnot. These are massive and they are extremely dangerous um, for the paddlers and they are cutting away property owners' land. So that's why I was thinking, not removing all the log jams, but coming, and maybe that's in a different, um, group that you're getting together, Alan, to talk about the whole log jam thing, but I think that's something that needs to be addressed for water quality, for farmers, for... I think it'll be one of the issues that come up. I'm sorry? I'm pretty sure it'll be one of the issues that, that says we need to look at this. Yeah. Is there another panelist that would like to take a stab at that one? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say that I'm actually very familiar with log jams. My first job in the DNR back in 1997 was working on wild 
Wildcat Creek. I was a summer employee working the scenic section of Wildcat Creek, cutting out log jams and picking up trash and picking up after fishermen and keeping the, clean, the creek clean and clear. So I, I've done my fair share of work knee deep in the water with a chainsaw. And I, and I know how controversial and weird it can be. And the second part? The second, Dale should be able to answer this one for sure. Um, are there any restrictions? I know you mentioned there's not a, a whole lot of teeth in this recreation designation, but there are, are there any restrictions as far as like number of access sites that can go in or work that can be done on it? Uh, I don't believe so. So I know that the Blue River Plan had some of those restrictions in it, but I don't, it's been a while since I've read the Cedar Creek Plan to see if there were any restrictions in there, but I don't believe that there are. I can give you a copy of the plan if you'd like one. I brought one. Oh, sure. Okay. Great, question back here. Thank you. Uh, Heather, this is for you, really. Uh, Based upon the increased recreation that we've seen happen along Cedar Creek, has acres seen any uh, increase in damage or just sort of over overuse in its properties in the Cedar Creek corridor? Can the acres have any plans with respect to? I'll ask it this way: Is there sort of upper limit that acres sees in terms of the ability to support uh, recreation activities in the corridor? Uh, yes, uh, particularly these last several months uh, with the pandemic and the shutdown, um, one of the few safe activities uh, for folks to engage in uh, were outdoor uh, recreational activities. So we saw a huge spike in use of the preserves uh, to the point um, where it's, it's getting dangerously close to, to overuse. Uh, Bicentennial Woods is a good example of, of this. Um, that, that, that's one of our most heavily trafficked properties. Um, the, the compaction of the soil along the trail system is, is quite significant. Um, some of our other less visited properties, we're starting to see, uh, to see that happen. A lot, of, um, a lot of people that don't understand that they're in a nature preserve and they're not um, at a city park um, a lot of trash, a lot of um, just misuse, going off trails, climbing trees. Um, it's, you know, we, we take partial responsibility for that. Uh, you know, there's a lack of education. Um, so it's an opportunity to better educate folks about what's expected when you visit a nature preserve, um, that it is different from um, a city park that has, you know, picnic facilities and a, and a paved sidewalk system. Um, what was the second? Uh, oh, is there an upper limit? We haven't yet, um, we haven't yet kind of set our sights on, on what that upper limit would be. Um, it's hard for us to track how many people are in the preserves. We do have a counter right now at Bicentennial Woods. Um, as people um, enter and exit the trail system there, um, um, we are counting just to, to try to get our bearings on, on what that number is. We haven't yet set that upper, upper limit yet. This question may be for Dale, I'm not quite sure, but it's sort of taken along with the question that uh, Mr. Van Gelder asked. There's a certain section of Cedar Creek that I've been out probably about five times with the property owners. And there's littering, trespass, they're building fires on some of the sandbars, there's defecating, uh, and also some for other recreational activities going on. And my question is this, how are you educating or who's responsible for educating the canoeist, particularly with private property rights? Because once they step out of their canoe, it's a game changer. Uh, I will start by saying that you are, you are correct, the current DNR interpretation of the uh, the status of Cedar Creek and its navigability rules are that if they step out of the canoe, then they're on private property. Um, we, we in the DNR try to educate people the best we can. We have websites about trail etiquette. We have water trail etiquette. Uh, we have a paddling guide. We, we try to educate people. However, there are bad apples out there. Um, we mostly tell people that if they're having issues like that, they need to call local law enforcement. They can call a conservation officer. 
Um, if you've got people trespassing on your property, that's that's what you have to do. But I'm suggesting that same thing. By the time the CEO gets there, they're gone. Uh, unfortunately, that can, that is often the, that is often the case. Yeah, unless they're doing the campfire, that's the only, about the only time they can catch it. I I don't have a good answer for that. We we don't have enough law enforcement to be out everywhere all the time. Uh, if you have areas that have become hot spots that are that are massive problems, you can talk to your sheriff's department. You can talk to the conservation officers. They can set up remote cameras. They do that for hunting violations, dumping violations. If they have, if you have a very serious problem, they can set up a remote camera and try to catch these folks. Dale, I have a question. Um, early on, you said that in this designation, each area is managed kind of the way the people in that area want that. So, Blue River is different than Cedar Creek, mm -hmm. and up here it was kind of more of a hands-off kind of management style. Does that ever get re revisited, or if so, how does that process work? Um, I'm, I'm just asking because I, I simply don't know. Uh, it, it could have, at this, at this current point, the DNR has taken a hands-off approach to all of the scenic rivers. We, we no longer have the staff or the money to send crews out to uh, take care of these rivers. So they, they still have their same designation, but the DNR is no longer spending its time or resources um, in a hands-on approach of taking care of these rivers. We, we simply don't have the, the time or the money to do it anymore. Okay, well then... Talk to me, so past the Division of Water Quality, what's the jurisdictional thing for these areas of designated group? I wanted to give Chad just a chance to respond there and then we'll get back to that. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I guess I, I could offer some perspective from, from the city of Fort Wayne's standpoint, I suppose, from Parks and Rec. Um, you know, Three years ago, it was the exact same thing in Fort Wayne, right? Nobody was, quote unquote, taking care of anything, really. Um, in, in 2016, uh, a riparian management plan was put together uh, by an outside contract. Um, and that was kind of the impetus for everything moving forward for riverfront development, for riparian management, et cetera. So from that point, and, and, and this doesn't answer the question because you know I don't know who who would do this hiring, who would do the management of it, but this is just one way we've done it. Um, a, a, a new division was started, right? And that was within the Parks Department and that's Riparian Management Division. So we have a very small crew, we have some resources, we have some tools where people are going out, are doing cleaning, are removing deadheads, are removing log jams, are keeping an eye on everything, right? Um, and that's, and Parks Department, the Board of Park Commissioners owns a lot of that land, right? I mean, many parks are within the flood pl the floodway right along the river. So that makes things a little bit easier because there's a clear line of who owns that, that portion, correct? Um, but um, even in the case of, of uh, private ownership, we're still out there just for the sake of safety, for the sake of education, still removing uh, hazards. Um, the, the, the issue of people um, doing things they shouldn't. You know, I mean, if you take a riverboat tour downtown or you get on a boat downtown, you'll definitely see plenty of people doing things they shouldn't do. Um, and we don't, we're not the police either. I mean, we don't have the resources to be able to keep up with that, but it's the exact same answer Dale gave. I mean, we're just working with local law enforcement to try to do what can be done. And that's a huge question and it's a huge problem, but I see that on the one hand. On the other hand, the idea of taking something away or limiting something from, you know, the majority of folks who aren't and are doing good uh, just because of the few that are doing bad. Just, I don't know. It doesn't sit well with me. But. We'll go to another question. I, I just wanted to clarify the maintenance comment because from a historical standpoint, having not been a commissioner nor on the range board in years past, I, re I respect the perception of what and things that did happen in the past. Hence, that is the reason we're having this dialogue today. And 
that is to build a coalition of individuals that have an interest in trying to do it the right way, to be respectful of the area and everyone's desires, but also have a safe environment so individuals can enjoy it for what, what its intent was meant to be. Uh, quite frankly, there have been issues in the past that have been raised by other counties to Allen County, and why aren't we doing anything about this because it's causing a problem in our county. So that's, to some extent, that's a level of the impetus of this dialogue as well, is that what are we doing as a community to try to mitigate potentially, and this may sound wrong, the damage that we may be doing to other areas that we need to kind of coalesce and want to figure out a better way to do this so that it's beneficial to all parties. Because water continues to flow no matter what we all try to do here, and it goes beyond the borders of our county. Hence why we have the counties here involved doing doing this dialogue. So I, I, I totally commend your comment relative to maintenance, but maintenance is a broad term and not necessarily negative, but something that should be managed and figured out so that we can, again, do something that continues to enhance what this particular waterway is to this community and this region. Thank you. I think I had another question over here. Picking on Dale, so um, two things. One is that um, a lot of people who live along the river believe that hydrology doesn't apply to them. And so when they build on the outside of a curve, they, the solution is to dump a bunch of concrete down the hill. I was wondering if that is within a fair lot to do that kind of thing on a state scenic river. And if not, who is going to be involved in stopping it? So the, the easy answer to that question is you're not allowed to do that on any river, not just a state scenic river. Um, th those kind of problems tend to get more attention because of a state scenic river designation. The, the locals are often looking out for the, the, the protected status of this river. But anybody that tries to do a bank stabilization project without a permit from the Division of Water for filling the floodway is in violation of numerous state laws. So the, if you see somebody doing that, the best thing you can do is Call the DNR, call a conservation officer, they will open up a case on that and figure out what's going on. Um, and you are absolutely right. If you don't do those things properly, by, if you don't understand hydrology, you just think dumping a bunch of rock along the outside of a bend will solve your problem, you're in for a, a big surprise. Uh, I've got some places on Wildcat Creek where there is a rock wall where somebody dumped it on the outside edge that's now on the inside gravel wall. The water went around it and just kept going, and now you have this beautiful rock wall on the inside of a bend where it didn't do a darn thing. So, yeah, you have to work with a hydrologist. You have to work with engineering. And if you see that stuff going on, let us know. And the second part is just recently we had some people on the river decide that they were going to build a fire on a gravel bar in the middle of the river. And I knew you said once they get out of the canoe, they're on private property. How do we determine whose property they're on. Uh, in that case, you're gonna probably have to go back to your local county. You're gonna have to look at the surveyor's office, the plat books to find out who, who owns that property. Well, it's in the middle of the river and I'm not sure that the boundaries are gonna be specific enough to us to determine whose gravel bar it is. They, they, should, they should be. So if, if the river, because Cedar Creek is not listed as navigable, so the state doesn't own or control the river bottom, it should, it should have a local landowner. So, so we did, I think we have to go back to that. So a lot of times it's down in the middle of the creek, and I'm not sure whether that would apply or we have to go to the map. Uh, you, you'd have to go to the map, because I, I don't have a magic way of, of just standing out there and saying that that's going to be a local county, a local county issue. Your surveyor's office should be able to tell you. Question back here? <laughs> yeah, one back here. For Melissa and, and possibly Ben will chime in as well. Does the Purdue Center keep track of who seeks the information? Like, for example, you know, agricultural groups looking for predictions uh, in connection with rainfall and, and heat, um, or for that matter, legislators thinking about uh, future policy decisions. 
So does the center keep track of who might be asking for the information? Did you hear the question, Melissa? Melissa, did you? Uh, if I heard your question, let me make sure I understood it. You're asking if we keep track of who's accessing the climate impacts information? Yeah, maybe more specifically if somebody makes a specific request, hey, we're really interested in you know what's going to happen with rainfall in the next 50 years. Is that something, is that a dialogue or, or information that we all keep? Um, yes and no. We informally do keep uh, records. I'm the uh, coordinator for the impact assessment project, and so I do try to keep records of those. We do track um, what outreach events that we are invited to, what um, spin-off collaborations occur, uh, or data products that are developed to help visualize some of our data from outside groups. Uh, the data itself that are presented in the reports, um, you don't have to log in or have any kind of uh, code to get to them. They're all free and on our website. So, so to that end, certainly if people are coming and accessing it on their own, we don't have records of that. Um, but we do try to uh, maintain a loosely defined network of experts and um, information consumers so that we can try to facilitate when people need um, certain types of information that we don't provide, we can put them in contact with people who do have that and in the reverse. And so um, that's one thing I didn't talk about with the process of developing this impacts assessment. We really did try um, in the early stages to involve people who we thought would want to use this information to better understand what information they would be looking for um, and get that in the hands of our experts so they could try to address it as best as possible. Um, this was a voluntary statewide assessment, which means we didn't have any funding or mandate to conduct it, and so we had some limitations with um, the information that we were able to generate, um, but we are certainly uh, pleased with our ability to pull information together, get it into the hands of people who are looking for it, and we're continuing to seek out um, people who we think would be interested in this. So you had said, you know, state lawmakers. For example, we have been down to the state house several times, whether it's um, testifying to uh, in a hearing or just doing uh, individual meetings with small caucuses to try to help them see what this means for them. So, so there's a lot of different ways we're trying to get this information out. Um, hope I answered your question. You did, thanks. And, and sort of follow up to that with maybe Ben can address this is, is what kind of information is now being shared in the ag world with farmers about what they're likely to be seeing in the next 20, 30, up to 50 years in their farm based upon this research. So as it, as it relates to, to climate and changing climate in particular, we lean heavily on, on the, the, the work of, of Melissa's group and the, the Climate Center um, to, to share, you know, uh, what their projections are, but then also there's a lot of value in those hundred year histories, right? That they show uh, in addition of this is what we're already seeing. And, and that really begins to facilitate those conversations with farmers of, yeah, you know what? It does seem to be getting, you know, wetter at this time, or, you know, we, you, you talk to, uh, I'm fortunate. I still have my grandfather, you know, 92 years old has farmed all of his life. And, you know, in some of these past couple of years, when he says it is a strange weather year, that that tells you something, right? That that things are things are changing, things are happening. So just opening that door, uh, and and our organization, our group's focus is really on, um, you know, where where Melissa really kind of let off the. What's our response to that? So okay, so yes, things are changing. Um, you know, what are the opportunities? What are the options that we have in order to to uh, to, to handle and to manage that? And just making sure that that information is getting out in front of farmers. So they understand the, the full suite, right, of options that, okay, if it's going to be wetter at this time of year, how, how do my operations adjust? What are the opportunities? What are the risks that I have out there um, to me? So. Just to add one more thing to that um, with who else we're coordinating with, we do uh, work very closely with Purdue Extension and also with our soil and water conservation districts to get this information out at their um, annual meetings, both through a, as an organization and then um, to their county level meetings. So really trying to 
um, partner with people who already have connections to those folks on the ground who um, we can then work with to, to get that relevant information to Thank you, Melissa. Uh, uh, this is one of the questions for Chad. Again, I'm going to back on the development for DeKalb County. So you're very nice to know that the Plains City is an attraction for the workforce and, and people to be able to utilize the waterways. So I was particularly with the Cal County City to create the, you know, the, the core of that focus is, is Anchorage considers the, the corridor, you know, really all the south, uh, which I know kind of steps outside of what's the, the, the preservation area. Um, but as far as like tracking usage, are, are there ways that, are, are there programs or different things that they utilize to track usage from various access points? So I think, you know, big picture is our communities want to, um, you know, utilize Cedar Creek as, as a quality of life asset. Uh, you know, how, how do they, um, how, how are they able to quantify, you know, that usage and, and really to try to say that this is a, you know, a, a growing lifeblood to, to our local community? Are there trackage? I don't know if it's different ways to go about it, or is it sitting out there one Saturday and trying to count vehicles and boats down the river? I'm just curious. No, I mean, from our standpoint, we don't have any silver bullet or anything like that. Um, Fort, Fort Wayne right now, I think, is in a unique position and kind of at the, at the start of the wave, you know, just, just catching the wave. Um, I guess short answer to your question, um, no, besides just counting. Um, part of what I did know, we're in a unique position, one, in that, you know, at, at Promenade Park in particular, right, we have, we have a, um, an agreement with the outfitter that's there, um, where through them, yeah, we can track how many people are going out. But that's only runs, right? That's not people bringing their own boats. Right. Um, we have another DNR access site in the city um, that we have not done counts on. We do have cameras up. If we wanted to, we could go back and make counts. Um, I, can, I can tell you that it's just as busy as any of the sites I talked about up here on Cedar Creek, pretty much any weekend, including many weekdays throughout the, the season. Um, no, it, it, there are more calculated gambles going on though right now, right? Um, the, the creation of that park in particular was kind of set up as the catalyst to attract private development and show that there is an appetite for people to be in the, in the downtown area around the river as the river being the amenity. And so that was kind of phase one of all that. So as far as the, the idea of riverfront development goes, that's the catalyst. Phase two is moving into furthering that, but further strengthening the case for private development and starting to build an infrastructure for private development at the same time, right? So while there's no, we don't have any specific metrics that, that the city is following or anything, our, our contract through the phase two of riverfront development right now, part of that design team has an economic de development design team on it as well and is tracking that and is making the case for that for the development. So uh, all you can ever do is forecast, I mean, we'll know that, and, and um, measure later. So hopefully the forecasts are correct, and you know, the, the uh, um, investments now, you know, pay off in the future, which is really the whole idea for it. So as far as usage goes, no, I mean, it's just like, uh, even on our land trails, Fort Wayne trails, they'll go out, I know they just go out and do, they just post people at spots and they start counting them all day, just to get their numbers, so really seems to be the clearest way to do it. I'm going to add to that a little bit, that uh, we do get numbers in the DNR, we do get numbers from uh, Fort Wayne uh, and some other communities. There are trail counters that you can put out on hiking, biking, walking trails. So there, there are some calculated numbers, and we've seen since COVID has gone up, they have, they have substantially gone up, just like all other recreation. We, for the life of us, cannot figure out how to do water trail counts, though. Um, you're looking at 100 feet across, you're looking at um, varying water levels. I have not seen the technology for doing water trail counts short of a human in a clipboard. Um, if anybody figures that out, please let me know. Because <laughs> I would really love to do some river counts in some places in India. And that's, that's been our, our approach too at Acres. Uh, beyond recreating on the water, those additional recreational opportunities within the preserves, um, 
the best we can, you know, short of installing turnstiles, is, um, is as I mentioned, we've got a, a trail counter um, right now that um, up at Bicentennial Woods. So that's that's the best way for us to be able to count the number of people um, going in and out of the preserves. It's not it's not exact, but it's the the best we can do right now. The technology available. And I, I have gate people here in the Fox Island, but it's still not an accurate count because I can't always have that point. Uh, Kyle, this question's for you. So I know that it, with its canoe trails, or you can get into here, put together a map, just launch sites on all the ones that were official and unofficial for getting access to the rivers and streams and all these Do you remember how many that was? One Cedar Creek. Well, just in general. I mean, I think people will just be surprised at the number. Yeah, so there's 87 access sites um, on 566 miles of flowing water in Northeast Indiana. If we're talking Cedar Creek specifically, there's six sites. Four of them are um, official sites, um, including Allen County and the DNR. Um, and then there's Tomble Road. And then the one just south of Auburn on that, I can't remember the name of the road the bridge um, that people use all the time. We have that listed on there. Okay, so that doesn't include Duck Coleman Lane. It does include Duck Coleman Lane. Yeah. Duck Coleman Lane. Mm -hmm. I, was, I just remember when that piece of information came out, I was just, that's a lot of people getting access to a river for no more official sites in their car. Um, and as somebody who I've learned not to go mow that home maybe on Saturday morning because there's no room for me to park. So um, people are using it. Good question. Yep. Another question. This might be for Dale. Is there a, a site that somebody could go to to find out who was seeking permits to do any sort of work, bank stabilization or otherwise, on Cedar Creek? Or with something you have to go to multiple places with, within the DNR and I have to do that. Yes, the, the Division of Water, their entire permit application database is public. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to find on their web page, but once you do find it, you can search by county, by water body, by permit number, and, and everything is there. And it's there are some people that do pay attention to that, and we will occasionally get an email, somebody asking me about a permit that hasn't come across my desk yet, so they found it before I did. Thank you. This isn't really a question, just a general comment. We've seen the uh, rainfall intensities in this area particularly uh, across the Midwest are increasing. We've seen the, the rainfall uh, storm events, the duration times are decreasing. So we're getting a lot more rain and much quicker. And that's leading to higher flood tricks. And I share that with you because if you really want to be proactive and protect Cedar Creek, we need to start looking at upland storage. And we at the River Basin Commission are already trying to do that, uh, working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and, and doing wetland restorations. Uh, but the other thing, and this is not popular, but sometimes we need to, you know, uh, put boots on the ground and, and stand firm, and that is no more encroachments in the floodplain. Uh, if we start decreasing that flood conveyance area, we're going to continue increasing those surcharges. So, combination, no more development of floodplain and open storage. And your comments are kind of touching on where some of our future meetings with this group are going to go because we're going to start talking about strategizing. Uh, so that's, that's a nice segue to what um, we'll be doing in the next couple of meetings. Any other questions from the group here? What I thought I would do, we have a few minutes left before we wrap things up. I wanted to just quickly ask each panelist kind of a closing question and then um, maybe she could just answer it in one or two minutes. So pretty brief here. We've all had a chance to speak. Um, and then we'll close out with, with Dan and Alan um, in just a few minutes. I'll start with, um, with Ben here. Ben, how do you see collaborations supporting agriculture in the Cedar Creek watershed? So how do you see future or present collaborations supporting what you support? 
Yeah, so I think meetings like today are a really good start um, because oftentimes this kind of ground setting never gets to happen, right? And, and everybody goes into these processes with their own bias and their own agenda and, and not really considering anybody else's perspective. And I guess as you, as you move through, um, you know, where I see collaborations being, being helpful is um, a lot of times we all have a similar goal towards the end of, you know, we, we want this to be a functioning watershed. We want, you know, everything to be successful. We just don't talk about it in the same terms or the same way. Um, and so I think where you are able to bring these multiple parties together to understand of, well, you know, this is, this is what I need to be successful and this is what you need to be successful, then, then, then you can begin to, to, to work that out. If, um, if you don't have all those parties at the table, if you don't have that collaboration where everybody's having that conversation, um, then, then one side's gonna feel like they quote win and the other side loses and that's where you get controversy for years to come. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and Heather, what lessons learned could you offer, maybe one that stands out, when it comes to working with communities on managing stream corridors? Anything, it's kind of a lesson learned when you work with communities. Um, one, of, one of the biggest lessons that Acres has learned is that once these natural areas disappear, it's impossible it's next to impossible if not impossible to get them back um, it's much easier to be proactive and in, in working with communities to protect these places um, than to try to restore something um, after it's been uh, developed thank you and chad my question to you is what advice can you offer about working with communities on managing stream corridors for recreation uh, considerations. So what's one piece of advice in terms of working with communities on management? On management of the corridor itself or in terms of recreation specifically? Uh, recreation within the corridor. Um, needs and wants. Um, really Kind of the same approach I would take to any scenario and how I laid it out when I spoke before, you know, taking a look at what you have, um, what's working, what's not working, and looking at the opportunities that are there, uh, looking at the constraints that present themselves, and turning all those constraints into better opportunities, um, trying to get as diverse uh, input as possible from the community, you know, not just looking to one segment of the community. I'm trying to get as many people involved as possible and give as many people a voice as possible. Um, and at the same time, balance. Um, balancing all other uses and not just having uh, blinders put on to one use, such as recreation. And, you know, I mentioned that before also, you know, taking a good hard look at both the economic side of things, looking at the ecology and environmental side of things, looking at other land uses such as agriculture, um, looking at uh, resiliency in, in regards to climate change. So really trying to take as a holistic approach to any problem as possible is, you know, that's, that's, that's as good of advice as we can give, I, I'd like to think. Thank you. Well, we're hoping to do that with this, with this series of sessions here. Um, I'm gonna go to Melissa here. Um, where do you see future opportunities for communities to address climate change? So how can communities address climate change? Sure, so there's a lot of things we need to do to address climate change. And when we talk about addressing climate change, I think we need to clarify a little bit if we're talking about um, mitigation or trying to address the problem at the source, or if we're talking about adaptation, so adjusting to the changes that are already happening and that'll continue to happen. Um, because when we're talking about mitigation, we talk about the source, right? The bottom line of what is driving the changes in climate that we've been seeing in the last, you know, 50 to 100 years is the um, burning of carbon-based fuels, right? How we fuel um, our economy, how we power our cities, how we move our goods from farm to, to home to all these other places. And so, there are a lot of opportunities for communities to do mitigation. Um, 
have a lot of cities here in Indiana already working to integrate um, solar into the landscape, wind into the landscape, um, improving efficiency, which is great because it also improves uh, our bottom line in a lot of cases. We're, we're not using as much energy. We are saving money. Um, and a lot of these technologies are becoming less expensive, and that makes you, uh, the time to give that money back um, much shorter than it used to be. There's also a lot of other benefits of mitigation at the community level. If we're talking about air quality or safety on our roads with the way that we're laying out our communities or how we improve water quality when we switch fuel sources. So if we're talking about mitigation, I think that we have so many opportunities for communities. We want to shift to adaptation. There's also a lot of opportunities. Um, ben was telling us about use of cover crops and um, other types of more precision agriculture. There's ways that we can um, utilize our channels that help reduce the impact of flooding. The bottom line when it comes to climate change is that the problems we already know and face, the places we're already naturally vulnerable are going to intensify, they're going to continue. So we're not talking about adapting to a bunch of things we are unfamiliar with or never seen before. Right? So we need to be able to get a handle on things already causing us problems today to help us for tomorrow. We have a lot of tools to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. And final question, um, back to Dale. If you can think of it, what would be one barrier that you've encountered when you've worked with a community regarding scenic river designation and how did you overcome that barrier? Uh, well, this isn't a happy story. Um, we have to end on a positive note. Uh, I'll have to try. Um, we have to deal with a lot of misinformation. There are a lot of people that think that the Scenic River Program is some sort of control or a taking over uh, of their land or it's going to tell them what they can do. And it really isn't. It was The intent was to be a recognition um, program and something that could work to enhance and protect the river. So it's, it's both preservation and recreation. Um, and the, the misinformation can sometimes, it's especially true today, but misinformation spreads so much faster and further than the truth. So getting that information out uh, can sometimes be really difficult. We had a river designation attempt in 1997 on Sugar Creek and it failed because of that exact reason. Uh, the, the landowners all thought that this was the state coming in to take their property and it was them who came to us. The, so the positive side of that story though was is that in lieu of state control, Montgomery County instituted rules for Sugar Creek. Instead of having the state designation, they had their own local control. And they came up with rules that were way stricter than anything I could ever dream of. So they, they put in bans against clear cutting on the river. They put in bans against construction on the river. They put in all these official rules that really did protect the river better than what we could have. All right, does that answer your question? I think it does. Oh, and I, I guess while I'm here, I'm gonna put a commercial up. The, the Scenic River Plan from 1975 for Cedar Creek is available on our website. We've had the, the three of them up. It sounded like a couple of people, sounded like Chad may have read that, and some other people have seen it. Uh, it's not a secret document, it's right there on our website, including links to the laws that establish the, the program. Everything you want is right there. All right, thanks, Dale. Right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up the moderated panel discussion. Um, and I want to pass things off to Alan and Dan to talk about kind of our next steps as a group. So, we would like to start with that. I wanted to do a uh, book well, yeah, for the next couple of meetings. All right, I'm working with limited information here. I know the date, and I know that they're going to be here. And so uh, that's going to be November 10th, 134, and December 10th, 134. And those will be primarily for working groups. Now, what that are going to be taking each of these areas, agriculture, environment, and recreation, and coming up with what are the issues, how are you doing The other piece of that is this meeting is being recorded and will be made available on the Allen County website and the Detroit.
Cobb County website so that the public can participate more. And there's a survey where they can help us identify the issues and what they want to see addressed and, and what is the strength of the Cedar Creek watershed. And do you want to be on a working group for one of these areas? From that, the working groups will be put together. We'll contact them, folks, who are going to be on this, and put those groups together, and they'll be taking this information and moving forward, putting an action plan together for Cedar Creek. Um, did I get it right, pretty folks? Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, okay. Yeah, so I'll give a little bit more depth on the session too. So in that meeting, we're going to be looking at opportunities, and aspirations, and figuring out what in the, what can we make of this. What are the opportunities that exist? What are the strengths that are out there? I can't do both at the same time. I'm saying in a bad place. We'll do this. We'll do it like this. And then um, in the session two, we're really going to look at what are strategies and objectives that we want to move forward with or sort of prioritize those and figure out who's going to be doing what and how we move forward. So that will be uh, December 10th is that final meeting. Uh, that's the third meeting. And then November 10th is session two where we're looking at our opportunities and aspirations. And again, we're going to be looking at those sort of four topics, agriculture, recreation, uh, natural resources, et cetera. Um, and so if you're interested in any of those topics, definitely reach out to Alan or one of us to get on the list and uh, participate. And we'll send you the details for participation of those. As Alan said, um, this vid or the video of this presentation or today's event will be posted on the county's website. You can share that among um, your social media circles if you want to. Um, but it's just going to be hosted there, and you can share it as wide as you like. Kind of an outline of the action planning process. So um, in the first meeting, is sort of a community vision where we're talking about the opportunities and aspirations. And, then, and that's also part of this meeting, too, is we're outlining the, prop, or the issues and um, learning more about the, the Cedar Creek watershed and the Scenic River designation. And then um, we move into the next two meetings where I, are, I already sort of talked about them, but it's aspiration, or aspirations and opportunities, opportunities and aspirations, and then uh, looking at prioritizing strategies and objectives. Um, the goal overall is to develop um, an action plan, which will sort of look like this. Um, yours will be different, of course, but we're going to pull in some tools that we have available, um, a decision support tool called the Tipping Point Planner. We'll pull some information out of that and apply it to this process. Uh, and present information to the to the small groups for decision making and, and uh, developing opportunities and strategies. And then on the right, you can see an outline of an action plan. So there's, I'll just read from left to right, there's a, a column for strategies, there's a, a column for action items, there's timelines that we're going to develop, uh, and we're going to assign responsible parties and then include any notes uh, specific to that strategy that we want to uh, include in the plan. So that's sort of uh, an overview of the next couple of meetings and also uh, the action plan, the sort of the final document, the final product uh, of this effort. Uh, we certainly thank you all for attending today. And uh, I'll add a couple things to that too. So if you're interested in the working groups, we will have those two facilitated discussions. So Dan, Steve, and I are going to be working with those groups in this room. We'll be spread out and you'll start talking through those different steps. Uh, but there will be some homework uh, in between the sessions, so we're asking for the working groups to keep making some progress so that we can come back together on the third meeting and continue that um, trajectory. So you'll have the opportunity to mull over these strategies. We'll put it together and help package it, but then get additional feedback, edit it, and then it'll be up to the steering committee and others and how to um, put that into practice. But uh, this is a process. Um, we're here to help and kind of guide you through some tools uh, to get it all together. So, but we're happy to continue to ask um, to answer questions about that. We'll get more um, information out, and the steering committee needs to meet to get some of those um, additional logistics together. We wanted to focus on the first meeting here since it's been so long with our, our COVID uh, delay, and then we'll quickly get into action for the next two. So, thanks again for coming today. I have a quick question. When are your uh, when are you intending to have the project complete? So the action register completed. We're well, well. We have that that last meeting in December 10th, and then it's up to the steering committee and the working groups working together to see when they can finish it all and polish it all. So that's something that the steering committee will talk about. 
uh, when we meet here in the next couple of weeks to get those plans and timelines. But we're trying to get as much done before the end of the year as possible. But so I imagine that it will be early next year once um, we have it completely finished up. But I think a lot of the information will be there and compiled in a matter of finishing the writing, probably January, February. It's hard to, with the breaks in there sometimes, it's hard to get some of that final work done, but um, we'll definitely help coach it through to the end. When we started, this was already was done by now, but <laughs> so, this is the yes. meeting that was supposed to happen in April. Yeah, our goal was to finish this by December this year, so we'll at least have the, the information compiled, we'll have some format done um, that will bleed into 2020, the next year, 2021 for sure. Anything else? Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. I mean, this is the first step. And it really is the first step. So I appreciate you taking time out of your day to show up, to contribute, to participate, help us get the word out. Um, I understand the web, it will be on the website probably by the middle of October. It'll take about a week to get it up there. Encourage your friends, neighbors, groups that you're involved with to go on there, view it, participate. Help us get the word out, and most of all, be well, be safe in these most uncertain times. Thank you.